Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Encounter Church. We are going to start by singing some songs. We would love it if you would stand up and sing with us. Encounter Church. My name is Chris Fozzi. I'm the pastor here, and we're so glad you're here today. Uh, it's a holiday, but that doesn't mean we're taking a break, right? We believe that freedom is one of those things that we'll celebrate this week. And one of the things that if you know a veteran, if you know someone who's served in the military, if you look at our history, you know that freedom is not free. It always costs something. And that's why we set aside these, these moments in our culture. It's why throughout our calendar, we take, us, we take these moments as a nation to celebrate because we recognize freedom's not free. Someone had to pay so that we could experience freedom. And uh, 
What I love about that is that we also on the Christian calendar set aside days to do that as well. That on Easter, we recognize that that's that day that we celebrate the freedom, that it wasn't free. And that's why maybe if you're new here today and you're kind of checking out Encounter Church, you're like, did I step into church or a rock concert? And I would say both, um, because we believe that freedom is worth celebrating, not just national freedom, but freedom in life, hope, peace, joy, those promises that we, we have in Jesus, that endless praise is worth celebrating that. And um, so if you're new here today, you picked a great Sunday. Jason's going to be coming up in a few minutes, and um, he's going to be delivering a message from his heart he's been processing through. And, uh, and our band's going to lead us in a few more songs to just continue to celebrate the freedom and the joy and the peace that Jesus brings. If you, if you are new here today, maybe you're joining us online or you're physically present, one of the things we've created for you is the Encounter Church app. It's a way that you can send prayer requests. It's a way that you can learn more about the church. It's a way that you can engage with us at your comfort level. And it's a free, uh, it's free app. And you can download it at EncounterChurch.com forward slash app. Um, or if you prefer the non-digital version of the app, we you were handed when you walked in. It doesn't pinch or zoom. It doesn't submit. Um, but it doesn't burn your data plan, which is nice. Um, and you can do everything from the app that you can do on here. So thank you for being here today. We hope that you, in the midst of our time together, you experience the hope and the help, the profound encouragement that we believe Sunday morning can offer here at Encounter Church. So let's continue to sing.
I surrender. I surrender. I surrender all. Surrender all. I surrender. I surrender all. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Encounter Church. Good morning. Welcome to Encounter Church, everyone. So glad that each and every single one of you are here. On July 1st, you didn't need this public service announcement, but it's hot today. Yeah? Anybody? I got out a little early this morning. I'm like, I don't care. It says 82. It feels like 94 right now, right? But I don't know uh, about you. Anyone love the heat? And may maybe like, okay, one person. Great. Enjoy have a great summer. Gosh, New England. I mean, we don't like the cold sometimes, but you got to like something, right? I like the heat until I, like the shirt kind of sticks to you, that kind of hot, you know? Get, get rid of the humidity, and it's uh, not too fun. Last night, actually, or two nights ago, I was in New Hampshire camping with my boys for a couple of nights, and someone said, oh, it must have been hot. I'm like, no, not up there, right? Get in the mountains, get inside, get away from the sun a little bit, and it feels like 70 degrees inside the tent, even though camping's changed. Any camping lovers? Probably like two of you, right, according to what I just found out. Okay, yeah, maybe some camping lovers. Now, there's different versions of camping, right? I don't know about your version of camping. Well, I, I stay at KOA. I don't know if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with the KOA campgrounds. Um, they're really nice. Um, and uh, this particular one, there were only like four tent sites. Well, I tent camp, right? Some of you are thinking, no, I don't do that, right? And so I don't know if you have like a 50-something foot RV. I don't think they go that long. I'm exaggerating on purpose, right? But these RVs can be really nice. But then there's the tent camping. But then there's rustic. I say, well, growing up, I remember going from the tent to the pop-up camper. Any pop-up camper lovers? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, what's that? Yeah, don't worry about it. If you don't know what a pop-up camper is, I know that the hotel is waiting on you, right? Or the Airbnb, right? But I just remember, you know, that, you know, however, I'm doing this. I don't even remember. Is this the way you pop it up or something? I don't know. Anybody? Yeah? I just remember as a kid thinking, that's amazing. Our house is being built right before my eyes. And we never quite, you know, got to, like, the legit driving RV in uh, my household. But my mom and dad bought a camper. It was like 28 feet long, and I just remember thinking, this is the life right here, right? Well, we went uh, tent camping, but it's changed, right? 2018 uh, tent camping, you like have um, blow-up mattresses. Some of you are like, well, that doesn't count, right? If you have a blow-up mattress in a tent, come on. But sitting there with my iMac, I, I went on to Netflix. Yeah, exactly. 20, you're laughing, but you would do it too. Those of you that laughed, you're like, yeah, that's what I do when I tent camp, right? You, you, you know, you open up the iMac with your power cord, right? And you go into Netflix and you're on the Wi-Fi in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. Um, that has nothing to do with today's message. I just, it, it was hot today and I'm five minutes into my sermon time. and I'm like, I probably should jump into to that. And so, uh, anyways, enjoy the heat. If you've never tent camped, here's, here's your action item today. Here's your homework. We like to give a little homework to change your life at Encounter Church because we do believe that we want to be a church that's practical. And so while this is not spiritual, this is practical. Go camping. All right. And those of you that camp, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, yeah, you need to go camping. Those of you that have never camped, I am sorry that you have never camped, but it is fun. Today, and uh, a Sunday, a week from today, we're going to have two messages that are that are standalone. Those of you that have been around Encounter Church, you know that we like to group our messages and theme them around certain series that will last three, four, five weeks. Normally, the the amount of Sundays in a month, normally four or five weeks. So this week and next week are just two standalone messages. One that I am teaching today. And then one that our other pastor, Chris Causey, is going to be speaking next week. But on the following Sunday, July 15th, we're going to start a, a new message series um, entitled At the Movies. And so we hope that you'll come. It's going to be a fun, engaging four weeks that will kind of uh, taper over into August, the first Sunday in August. I believe it's August 5th. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be exciting as we look in to see what does the Bible say about life and how can we find the, the elements of truth even in what we see in today 
today in film, and how can we learn from that? And so it's going to be fun. I hope that you'll come back uh, for that series that's coming up. But today uh, I've been excited to share with you and kind of link a few things that God's been even doing in, in my heart. For those of you that are um, a mom or dad, you know there's nothing quite like that moment when you get to see your child for the first time, especially a newborn. And while the pregnancy, I would say, and Rachel's out here in front of me, and so she earns veto right because I'm talking about her pregnancy, right? I think the pregnancy was pretty darn good, right, for the most part. That was a slow shake, you know. It was good for me. I mean, it was really good for me. Except for that time I came home, and I was like, Rachel, I smell watermelon. Where is it? She's like, what do you mean, where is it? It's gone. I'm like, you didn't eat the whole thing. She goes, yeah. I did. Well, it was a good pregnancy. Other than that moment, I thought it was good. The labor, not so much, right? The labor was tough. I won't go into all those details, especially Rachel's thinking right now, you're not going to go into those details, are you? The answer is no, honey. I'm not going to go into those details. But I'll never forget looking at Josiah for the first time. There's just nothing like it. It's just a moment that's, that's really quite indescribable. You fathers or mothers that have seen the birth of a child know that there's just a moment that, that can't be captured, right? And I remember holding him and seeing how beautiful he was. Well, somewhat beautiful. After they cleaned him up, he was really beautiful, right? But it's just this beautiful moment because some of you are like, no, that's not how I remembered it. It was He wasn't very beautiful, right? In fact, even Rachel said a few moments later when I first handed Josiah to Rachel, she was like, (gasps) sorry, honey. This is the way I remember it. (laughs) What's wrong with his head? (laughs) And, you know, you know those stories, you know, and we have some that are in the medical field that have good experience in this. I see Sam there in the back. I have some good experience in this and what happens to the skull. And I'm not even going to even begin to describe it. It's just another one of those beautiful proofs of creation that we were created by a God and we were made in his image. In fact, that was a verse last week I read to my boys that God created us in his image, male and female. He created them. Genesis 1 verse 26 and 27 say that. And there's this moment, obviously, where some kids' heads don't look so good, right? And I don't know about you, but not all babies are pretty. I can say that, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes you look at it and you're like, oh, is it, I thought he was beautiful. And the first thing out of Rachel's mouth was, what's wrong with his head? She had a traumatic post, you know, 20 or 24 to 36 hours. I was like, nothing's wrong with his head. And Dr. Cowart, our, our doctor, and he said, don't worry, that, that'll be normal. And she knows that and all of her experience and that, yes, He'll be fine. And his head, did he did look normal 24 hours later. But nevertheless, he was beautiful, unlike anything I had ever seen. There's a lot of research that goes into the power of what we see and how it's linked to affection. And even reading last week, I was just blown away by some of the things that we learn, what happens neurologically, what happens emotionally, what happens psychologically when we see things that are beautiful. Be it that we see our spouse be it that we see a beautiful person, be it that we see a, a child that's born for the first time, be it even two years ago, I remember sitting in while we were camping a couple of years ago looking at the starry sky when you're outside of city and you don't see any light pollution, right? It's an incredible. There's just this awe-inspiring feeling that happens in the mind and the heart and this wonder when you just look and you say, wow. The eye has this incredible ability to interpret, right? And in the world of relationships, in the world of emotions, it's quite unique. But this question is even being researched. And this week I found it too. Is it possible for love at first sight to be real? I'm a show of hands. Either yes or no. Is it possible to experience love at first sight? Who says yes? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. A lot of hands. I thought there was going to be a lot of skeptics in there. Who says no? All right, and who wants to be really smart and say, define love? <laughs> Every single one of you are like, what you mean by that? Because there are different, there are different versions of love, right? What you mean love, and even in the Greek, the, the language that we read about, that even the Bible was written in, the Greek and the Hebrew, there's all these different versions of what does the word mean? And the easiest thing today, sometimes we look at the word love and we say, well, that's kind of like a brotherly love. Even when we look at the city of Philadelphia, right? It literally means, and that's from the Greek origin, uh, a city, right, Delphi, of brotherly 
love, philos, which is a Greek word. And so there's this brotherly affection, this affection that you feel towards someone. And there's a different type of love that often gets a negative sexual connotation that's an immediate feeling of like physical arousal. Well, that's not always negative in the sense, right? Sometimes it's a physical, the, the physical emotion that you feel when you see someone that's, that you love and that you care for. Yesterday, even watching my boys yesterday when we're by this lake in New Hampshire, I'm watching them and I'm watching Josiah play with some other kids and I'm watching Levi play in the sand and be in his own little world. And there's this feeling of physical pleasure that I feel looking at my sons, right? And then they feel when I look at them, and I just say, I love them. And so there's this brotherly affection, then there's this, this, this physical affection that we feel, and then there's obviously the sexual attraction, and that type of feeling that we have, that we have when we experience and we see something and someone that's beautiful and that we are attracted to them. Well, this incredible idea that when we look at things, we experience love is true. Now, we have to define it differently. We have to say, well, what's possible? You know, love at first sight is what happened when Rachel met me, right? Um, the way that she looked at me in my John Deere shorts, true, true story, I was wearing John Deere shorts that were handmade, uh, not by me. That would be weird if, you know, you get me off topic today. But um, that's not what happened when Rachel saw me. She probably thought, who is this country guy wearing John Deere shorts? But I experienced love at first sight when I saw Rachel. In fact, the day before, a mentor of mine, um, I should define what love, but never mind, um, I experienced that the day before I started uh, graduate school and seminary. Our mentor of mine looked at me and said, hey, I thought it was a trick question. I mean, he mentored me like in a, in, a, in a relationship. And I remember him saying, hey, listen, tomorrow when you start graduate school, when you start seminary, are you going to be looking for a wife? And I thought, no. I mean, listen, I'm going to school. I'm going to focus on like studying the Bible. I'm going to focus on being you know, a minister and a pastor. He's like, you crazy, man. I was like, is that a bad answer? I mean, I thought it was a pretty good answer. He goes, you're always looking for your wife. You know, you, you, you're, you're, are you praying that God would give you a great wife? I'm like, yeah, yeah, certainly. It's something I'm praying for. Because always be looking, right? Always be looking. Always be praying, right? There's a million fish in the sea, but one day there's going to be one. Always be looking. I, I, I was like, well, you kind of backed me into a corner. I thought this was like a spiritual trick question. No, I'm not. I'm starting like seminary tomorrow, right? Well, the next day I'm, I met Rachel. And immediately after watching her kind of share part of her story and talk with other people, I was like, I like this girl. So I went right up to her. And I was like, hey, so I'm going to a football game next week. You want to go? She's like, no. I said, all right, see you later. I said, but my friends are going. <laughs> She's like, who are your friends? She did go, by the way. But for four months, there was not love at first sight. In fact, uh, on the first time that Rachel ever said yes to going to a restaurant with me, by the way, let me ask you a question. When a male invites a female to a restaurant and they're by themselves, what's that called, everybody? Oh, yeah, that's right. Rachel, did you learn that word? Uh, on, on, on the way to the restaurant, she was like, I just want to tell you this is not a date. I'm like, yes, it is. We argued on the way to our restaurant, our first restaurant by ourselves, like, this is a date. She's like, no, it's not. I said, yes, it is. About a month later, we argued. I told her that I, that basically she should marry me, and she's like, "No, you shouldn't. No, we shouldn't." I was like, "But you like me?" She's like, "But no, I don't." This went on for four months, right? That's not going to tie into the message today, but specifically, I experienced this emotion, this feeling when I when I met Rachel immediately, and uh, a year later, we of course got engaged, and a year later, we got married, and uh, now almost fourteen years later, we're still together, and I won for the record right? I, I won, yes? Um, and there's a ring on her finger today to prove it. There are four things, uh, four times in the scripture that we find this word and this phrase, the apple of my eye. You like that phrase? Anybody? Yeah? The apple of my eye. Four times in biblical literature we find that. And what's powerful and incredible about this statement is that um, a few times when it's mentioned, it's actually talking about the way God feels when he thinks about us. Now, it's so hard for us to, to even interpret, even hard to imagine. If I were to ask you the question, how do you think God feels about you? 
I mean, most people, not not everyone, some people wouldn't even like that question. If you went up to someone kind of on the street, like, listen, I don't want to talk about God and what he feels, right? But today we're in church. I'm going to ask you, right? And you're here today because I, maybe you're interested or maybe some of you have had faith in God for a long, long time and you're comfortable with that question. Some of you might be exploring. And I, don't, I don't really know what I would say to that. I mean, I guess he loves us, right? Because that's what a, a God would do. A God would love us. Well, we see all throughout Scripture, and I remember even holding the Bible, I can picture one of my seminary professors, and, and the first time I had heard someone say this, that this is a love story, that the Bible is summarized as a love story, a story not just of the beginning and the end and everything in between, but a story about a God who loves you. And the phrase apple of my eye, while some of you may be familiar with that, we don't typically use that in our common language today, though we know what it means. But from Bible times through Shakespearean literature, and especially in that era of writing, to common day literature today, this is idea in this phrase that means something that you treasure above all else. Even the root of the Hebrew word, we'll look at it today in a scripture in Psalm, even the, re- uh, the root of the Hebrew word literally means two things, the pupil, the core, right? And number two is the core, the center. Above all else, like yesterday when I'm watching all these boys and girls play in the lake, there are two that catch my eye. Two. And the two that catch my eye are Josiah and Levi. Right? They are the apple of my eye. They are what I treasure above anyone else and above anything else. I love them. But King David wrote in Psalm 17, an incredible psalm, and he says, keep me. I'm I'm telling you the scripture, and we're going to look at it in just a moment together. Keep me as the apple of your eye. There's this idea that you, not King David alone, that we'll look at in just a moment, but you and I are the apple of God's eyes. Above all else that he created and above all else that there is, you and I are the apple of his eye. You're what he thinks about, you're what he sees, and you are what he loves. King David, even I, in fact, a year ago, we had a, a series about King David that I taught last summer, actually. So a year ago at this time, when we were uh, in transition uh, to the space, uh, we talked about King David a lot. King David was uh, a king of Israel, of course, but he was troubled. And the reason he was troubled is because of much of what his life was entangled in. Not just the drama of adultery and murder, but the drama of he being the king of Israel, being responsible for the bloodshed of many, many lives. Often to be king and to be centered and to have your nation be in control and to be in charge meant that you had to kill off the enemy. And they had many enemies after them. King David struggled, and the reason he struggled personally inside is that he not only had people after his country and after the Israelites, but he had people after him, just him. He was the target. You're never a leader at the top top of any team or any organization without someone not liking you, right? Imagine people not liking Tom Brady. I mean, yeah, some of you are like, yeah, there's a lot of people that don't like Tom Brady. For one reason or another, imagine people not liking Bill Belichick. Imagine people not liking, some of you might love your boss at your work. There's someone that doesn't like them. And you're like, what What do you not like about them? Right? When you're the leader at the top, there's always opposition. When you're the leader of a country, it doesn't matter how well you are remembered. I often hear people will reference people like a Ronald Reagan or a JFK, right? These heroes, these presidents, even the United States of America has had great presidents, right, in the past. When we look at in the lineage of, of our leadership, we have been honored by some great men and women that have been great, significant leaders in our country. There's not one of them that doesn't have an enemy, that doesn't have plenty of people that don't like them, something about them, right? Well, King David had a lot of enemies, We are privileged to read a lot of what King David wrote. And what he wrote down, let's say it's basically his journal. It's captured in the Bible. And in his journal, because he was a musician, he would often write in poems and in songs. Psalm 17 is what I'm going to read to you today. And we're going to have the ability to read many, many of his psalms, his songs, right? That Hebrew word, psalms, literally mean the songs. And so we have a, an incredible um, ability to read much of what he wrote and journaled about in the scripture. Psalm 17, I want to read to you. 
He says in verse 1, Hear me, Lord, my plea is just. Listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. Though you approve my heart, though you examine me at night and test me, you will find that I have plans no evil. My mouth has not transgressed. Though people tried to bribe me, I have kept myself from the ways of the violent through what your lips have commanded. My steps have held to your paths. My feet have not stumbled. I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. Show me the wonders of your great love. You who save by your right hand, those who take refuge in you from their foes. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. So for the first few verses, King David is crying out to God, saying, God, I need your help. And God, I'm innocent. Have you ever felt like you were the object of scorn, the object of ridicule, the object of opposition, right? And you're like, I didn't do anything, right? I mean, this is a, almost a common conversation in my house between one of my sons. They're like, listen, I didn't do anything. I'm like, of course you didn't, right? Whoever's the opposition, whoever felt like they're being attacked, right? They didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Well, this is kind of where King David is. Listen, and it's not that King David didn't do anything. Because we learn in other scripture and other stories and other, even other Psalms, there was plenty of wrongdoing in David's life. He was well aware. In fact, Psalm 51, he literally recounts how he is asking God to forgive him because of all the bad things he has done. And he even says, God created me a clean heart. Now, if you say, God, would you give me a clean heart? It probably means you have a, what kind of heart? Anybody? One that's filled with bad, right? And he knew, man, I made a lot of poor choices, right? In Psalm 51, he's crying out. So it's not that he thinks, he, this is not an arrogant psalm. This is a guy saying, listen, I am being pursued to be killed, uh, but I didn't do anything to them. So whoever's after him, he realizes in this moment, listen, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything to offend them. So God, would you help me. But at the end of this psalm, he says a couple of things. And if we could even put verse seven back up there, it says, show me the wonders of your great love. He kind of stops by saying, not just God help me, not God, I didn't do anything like I'm innocent. He says, show me the wonders of your love. And we'll keep this up here for a few moments. Some of you, even if I said, how do you think God feels about you? Some people would be uncomfortable with that because they don't think about it. It's not that it, maybe if they thought about it long enough or someone told them about it or someone maybe read them a story that they couldn't explore faith. And some people just don't think about how much God loves them. Even some of you that might have faith already and you say, you know what, I'm a Christian, I'm following Jesus, but I haven't thought very long about the fact that God loves me. Well, this could be a great psalm for you today to say, God, show me. Show me the wonders of your great love. I, I believe that you are a God. I believe that you are God and that you may, you do love people, but God, would you show me the wonders of your great love? You saved me. And this way he says here, you saved me by your right hand. And I know that you've been for me, but God, would you show me the wonders of your great love? No matter where you are in your journey, this is a great prayer that you could pray right here and right now. God, show me that you love me, right? Show me that you love me. And then in verse 8, he says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Keep me. This is the third of the references of the four that we find throughout Scripture. Keep me as the apple of your eye. You know what David realized? That God did love him. And then he has experienced in the past the incredible love that God has for him. But life happens, doesn't it? On that wedding day, there's nothing quite like, right, when you see your spouse coming down the aisle. In fact, I stole this guy from a guy named um, Dr. Mather that attended our um, ceremony. He came up to me afterwards and at our, um, what's that thing called? Reception. Thank you. I was just going to, what's the thing on Friday night or whatever? What's that called? You're at rehearsal dinner. Okay, sorry. Um, resume. All right, here we go. So he came up to us at our wedding reception. I said, right, okay, yeah. Wedding reception has said, you love her, don't you? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> he goes, you know, I never, I never look at the bride coming down the aisle. I always look at the groom, right? Not that the groom has to be weeping, that of which I might have been, like, weeping, like, to just, but he goes, I just always want to see the affection. He goes, keep that. Keep that. 
Now, every day when Rachel wakes up, I see her and I just start weeping. <laughs> oh, you're so beautiful. Every, even in the mornings. In fact, we have been married for one week, and I'm like, Rachel, what's wrong? And she just wasn't talking in the morning. And she's like, I don't like mornings, right? And it only took us about four days into our marriage to realize, oh, you ain't always happy? You know? <laughs> we had one of those engagements. I was like, man, it's perfect. It's all perfect. And then day four happened. She wasn't talking to me. I'm like, what's wrong with you? She goes, I, I just don't like talking. Okay, it's great. Talk to you later. <laughs> Have a good day at work. <laughs> or maybe I should just text you that. She does talk to me in the mornings now, right? We lose that sense of intimacy. And even people that say, you know, I, I, I believe that God loves me, but I haven't experienced it in a while. I haven't felt it. Some of you say, I don't even know if I have ever experienced the fact that God loves me. This is the beautiful exploration that we can have in this journey, even for you today, because you chose today to be at church, July 1st. 2018, you chose to be a church today. And I want to tell you today here at Encounter Church that there is a God who loves you. In fact, the Bible says that he's not far off. Many people today would say, hey, is God kind of close or far off? And most people would say, well, he's kind of far off. I haven't really experienced him. And there's this, this idea of even taught in the scripture in James chapter 4, verse 8. One of, the, one of the latter chapters in the Bible says, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. And even Jesus says himself, if you knock, the door will be, yeah, you can finish that sentence, some of you, right? If you knock, the door will be open. There's a God who loves you. And even King David in this moment saying, God, show me the wonders of your great love. I know you love me. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Same from a guy who knows I am the apple of God's eyes. I know that God loves me. I know that he's been there for me. Well, th three things I want to tell you today that keep us distant, not just in marriage, but just in life, right? That we don't experience love. We don't experience that, that longevity and that feeling of love, not just between God, but between others because of these three things. Number one, I want you to tell you this, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've done. Now, because of the choices that you make, because of the choices that I make, we feel distant, right? If I, if I do something terrible or speak badly towards my wife or against my wife, what happens? There's a gap that happens. In fact, um, one of the best books on parenting I've ever read, though I don't agree with probably 50%. You're like, wait a second. You like this book, but you don't agree with the 50%? It was by an Amish um, writer. And um, the Amish writer was writing about how to develop a relationship with your child, right? You can imagine how he feels about iPads and about camping probably with blow-up mattresses or something like that. I'm joking on that part. But it was by this Amish writer, and he, he gave this illustration. And, Michael, I wasn't prepared to share this book. To Train Up a Child is the book, is the title of the book, To Train Up a Child. Again, disclaimer, you're going to read this and go, I, yeah, you parent a little bit differently than me. And, again, I full disclaimer, but he shared this, he shared this illustration. He goes, relationships are about strings. You cut them or you tie them. That's all you do in relationships. Oh, and this, this was the gold of the book, right? Every word spoken, every word not spoken, every time you get down on your knees to play with your child, every time you choose not to, you tie or you break strings. You break too many, you'll lose them. You tie them, they'll never lose. Oh, I, 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 I got to tell you, I've broken strings. Any confession with me in there? Great, one of you. Great. Hey, I'm an interactive communicator, and I like to see body language, right? <laughs> That's okay. You don't have to. Um, I think some people are like, yeah, me? Yeah, it's all right. I'm an interactive communicator. Anybody broken strings before? Okay, thank you. Makes me feel better about my string-breaking ability. But almost every day I think about this, I need to tie some strings. I, I need to develop that core, develop that relationship, right? Right? He says, keep me as the apple of your eye. If you're in a relationship today, you want to keep it strong, don't you? And he says this, God, keep me as the apple of your eye. You know why he says that? Because he made a lot of choices in his life that separated him, that made him feel like he was distant. And there's an, each and every single one of us today can probably at some point or another say, yeah, you know what? I, I've made some decisions. In fact, I had a, a neighbor once, um, not in my neighborhood where I live now, but I, I had a neighbor once that said, listen, I, I've made way, 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 way too many mistakes to go to church. I'm like, listen, man, I don't know your story. And I'm, I'm not going to be that guy that acts like I understand what you've gone through. Because truth is, I don't. 
You don't understand what I've gone through. I don't understand what you've gone through. But I do know this. We're all the same. And that we make mistakes. We all break the strings. We all cut the strings, right? There's something we do or don't do. Something we say or don't say. We're all string cutters. I didn't tell him this. He wasn't ready for the Amish book. Um, nor was I even ready for some of the things that I read, right? But I didn't tell him that. But I said, listen, we're all the same. No matter what you've done, I want you to know that there is nothing that can keep you from being the apple of God's eyes. My sons, at their young age, have done things and said things that have hurt my feelings, right? Does that change the way I feel about them? Those of you that are in a relationship with your children and you know how much you love them, you know what that means. Even some of you that are distant from your children, right? Because maybe they're adults and things have happened and the relationship's not the same as what you wish it were, right? I've been in many conversations with many people about that and how difficult that is. And even those parents that say, you know, I haven't talked to my 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 son or, or my daughter in two years. I love them. In fact, one of my buddies is a physical therapist, and I can't, for namesake, um, mention his name because most of you would know this athlete. One of my buddies is a, phys- a physical therapist in Georgia, and he works with athletes. And he told me last week, he said, you know, such and such, that one such and such. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a therapist, physical therapist to his mother. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. He goes, yeah, except for it turns into counseling, right? They haven't spoken for years. He, the athlete, refuses to speak to his mother because of some things she said to him in high school about his athleticism. And he just won a major, major event of recent in the past year. And uh, she, last week, he called me and told me, he said, dude, so basically he's calling me for counsel to counsel this athlete's mom. What do I tell her? She's coming in like four days a week, and I promise it's not because of therapy. I told her she was ready to come once a week. Well, she's coming four times a week to get spiritual therapy, right, from my friend. And he realizes that with tears in her eyes, she goes, I love him. He doesn't know I love him, but I love him. But sin and and things have pulled them apart, you know. And so I gave him some things to to tell her and for her to try, even though I don't know all the backstory, even though some of it's been captured in the Boston Globe and the New York Times. There's a lot of drama in their relationship, and it's recently been exposed. Nothing can change the way you feel about someone, even though there's a lot of problems. Yes? God loves you. And even though we find ourselves distant from him, we find ourselves, you know, a dis, um, or, or um, should I say, like, not attached to God, there's nothing that can change the way God loves you. And you are the apple of his eye. Number two is this, no matter how you feel. This is a very emotional thing, right? No matter how you feel, feelings do not drive the reality of the love relationship between you and between God. Because it goes beyond the feeling, it goes to a covenant. In the same way that I was joking earlier that not every moment in my marriage the last 14 years has been and felt like it did the day that we got married, July 9th, 2005, right? Not every moment feels like that. There's only been two moments that didn't feel like that, right? That was a joke. (laughs) Is he serious right now? There are moments of emotions that are good, and there are moments that are not good, right? But no matter how I feel, no matter the moment, the circumstantial moment, nothing changes the covenant between us. God is the same way. No matter how we feel, no matter the highs, no matter the lows, there is a love relationship that God has with you. Some of you may know that. Some of you may be curious of that. Some of you may be skeptical of that. But i got to tell you, because I've read this book, the Bible, there are stories after story. And this is just one little piece of this story, right, that tells us and reminds us that God loves us. And that David, though he made plenty of life choices and plenty of mistakes that detached him from his relationship with God, he came back and said, God, I know that you love me. God, I know that I'm the apple of your eye. No matter what you've done, no matter how you feel. And number three, no matter the circumstances you find yourself in. No matter the circumstances you find yourself in. I've had conversations with people at times to say, you know, listen, man, you don't understand what I'm going through right now. And fill in the blank. And I listen, and most of the time I say, you're right. I don't understand that. You're going through that, not me. 
You can fill in the blank with what circumstance you find yourself in. Some of you could look back and say, well, two years ago it was good, but now it's not. Some of you may look back and say, opposite, two years ago the circumstances was quite low, but today it's better. No matter where you are in the journey of life, no matter where you are on the journey of relationship, no matter where you are in the journey in your workplace, no matter the circumstance you find yourself in, there is nothing, nothing that can take away the fact that God loves you. It does not matter what you've done. It doesn't even matter how you feel. And it doesn't matter the circumstance you find yourself in today. There is a God who loves you. I told you that I told my boys, Genesis 1, Rachel found this journal, interactive journal online. I don't remember what it's called. Be helpful. Do you remember what it's called? Write the word. Oh, write the word for kids. There you go. Google it. It's been fun. I have two days of experience and it's been really good. So in, in the morning we read pretty much one verse and they write out how they feel and then they write a picture of the verse. I, and I told you one of the verses this week was that male and female, he created them. Pretty foundational idea and concept about Christianity is that God is a creator. So we're starting in the Genesis and in, in, in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And, and so we're, they're writing out male and female, how God created us and in his image. And I said, boys, because I was thinking about this message too. I said, boys, there's nothing and no one like us people, humans, because he created us different. It was in his image. And it's not that like, well, you're the, you might be the apple of his eye, but not me because of what I've done. No, 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 that's not true. That's not the way this thing works. The way that God created people, he created people in his image. And when he created them in his, in his image, you know what he said about that? That he did a good job. God patted himself on the back. If you read Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, guess what? It was like, this is good, right? And I love that, that the Bible says about creation that God was pleased with creation. He was pleased with male. He was pleased with female. And then the rest of this book, thousands of years of history and literature, we read about this love story. And some of you related earlier in the message when I said a couple of times in different ways. Some of you said, I, I don't know. I'm kind of distant. I'm kind of exploring. Maybe God loves me, but I would be uncomfortable if you asked me, how do you think God feels about you? I don't know how I would say about that. Some of us could say, you know, God's pretty distant. I don't, I don't know what that means to even be connected to God, but, but yet I'm, I'm open and I'm interested. Well, I'm going to end today by sharing about Jesus. What Jesus did for you and for I on the cross was when God made himself known to the world. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he offered the forgiveness of sin that anyone who would believe in him could have eternal life. And him, you can even picture, people know what the cross looks like, right? You can even picture this. Since I don't have a wireless mic, I have to hit pause. Remember the shape in which Jesus would, would have been on the cross like this? This was a picture of God's love. You know why? He wanted a relationship with you. And Jesus paid the price on the cross. And that price was the penalty that we all deserve, that we all feel because of our mistakes and because of our sin, because of our struggle. That was the penalty for sin was death. And Jesus said, I will die for you to communicate to you that I love you. Some of you, if asked today, would you die for your spouse? Would you die for your children if you had to? Some of you, though, that's not an easy question. You'd quickly Say, so, yeah, oh my gosh, I, mean, I hate that question, but yeah, I mean, I would because I love them. Jesus gave his life. This Bible verse, some of you may have heard this before. Some of you may be hearing this for the first time. I'm going to wrap up today with this Bible truth. John chapter 3 is a conversation between, between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a teacher of the law. He had all the degrees that you needed, Right? And in, in spiritual law and understanding of the scripture, understanding of the Old Testament. But Jesus was in a conversation with him. And at the end of that conversation, Jesus sort of just lays it out for him. And he says this to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world. Now, this is really cool. Before I finish the verse, this was before Jesus died. 
right? Perhaps a year, maybe 18 months before Jesus was to die on the cross, he told Nicodemus what he was going to do. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him can have eternal life. Whosoever would believe in him could have eternal life. You know, believe today that you are the apple of his eye. You are. doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how you feel today. It doesn't matter what circumstance you find yourself in. Jesus gave his life to you so that you would, number one, know that he loves you. And number two, that you could have a relationship with him. We have people exploring and encounter church what that means. We have people just even last week, five people today, some that have been believers for a long time, some that just became believers recently. We, we got to baptize those of you that were here last week, five people that um, showed the world symbolically through this baptism that they're now following Jesus with their life. We have people that are exploring, people that are asking questions, people that are that will send us emails, people that will meet with us face to face. I hope that you'll explore that today. Hope that you explore the truth. If if you're exploring that today and you say this, God, show me that you love me. And I would say he did that. He did that through his death on the cross. Let's pray. God, thank you that we can read Psalm 17. King David, as he struggled, that he poured out his heart to you. That we, God, know that no matter what he did, no matter how he felt, no matter what circumstance he found himself in, David knew you loved him. And God, today, we are all in different parts of our journey, of our life. We all have different struggles. Even two days ago, getting an email of just struggle. We all have it. We all feel it, God. Would you remind every single one of us today, no matter our past, no matter our past beliefs, no matter our current beliefs, would you remind us today, even in the midst of this next song as we sing it together, that you love us and that we are the apple of your eye. When, when you look at this world, you see us. When you look at this world, you see something special. And so God, today as we close and as we end this service together, I pray that it would be the power of your spirit that would encourage us and that would lead us, God, closer to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. During this next song, as I just said just a moment ago in my prayer, I, I hope that this will be a brief time and space where you could even explore in your own words and in your own way what it means to know today that you are the apple of God's eye and that he loves you. He loves you. During this next song, we're also going to take our offering. For those of you that call Encounter Church Home, um, so many of you are able to give and uh, give back as the Lord has provided for us. And so thank you for giving. We are a part of a generous church that loves to, uh, to, to love our community, to serve our community, and to continually uh, meet needs. And so thank you for giving. If you're a guest with us, your gift to us today could just be by filling out the connection card on the app. If you've downloaded that, if not, you can follow the connection card that you received when you came in the door. And as the baskets are passed around in just a moment, you can place that card in there if you have that. All right. Thanks for being at Encounter Church today. Let's stand. We're going to sing one more song together. All right.
spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. The spirit of the Lord is here. A miracle can happen now. felt that as well. As you leave today, feel free to stop by Starting Point if you'd like to speak with one of our pastors about anything or questions about who we are or looking to get involved. Also, I want to remind you that July 15th, uh, Sunday night from 6.30 to 8, we will be hosting our worship and communion night. It's a wonderful night with powerful music, a time of communion, and a message that we truly believe will bring you uh, closer to the Lord. So um, that those that event is um, the seats are limited, but we will provide childcare. So you can RSVP, RSVP for that um, either through the email that you were sent or also you can do it through starting point. So we hope to see you there. It's going to be an amazing time of fellowship and worship together. We hope you guys have a great day and a great week. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Bye-bye.